You've told me so many stories, Ollie, that I think I'd like to tell you one. And it's about a place that was very special to me when I was growing up, when I was a little kid. It's called Bateau Bay. And we would go there as a family every Christmas for our holidays. And the first view that you had as you came up in the car after the long drive from Melbourne was that through the sort of screen of trees that were banksias and gums, you'd look down and you'd see this beautiful curving beach curving around a lagoon that was a deep turquoise, turquoise and emerald, and this wonderful white sand. And then at each end there were rocky plateaus where little fish swam and crabs crawled. And uh, as I'd be coming, uh, getting close in the car, I'd be thinking of something very special that I hoped would happen. And when we got there, Eric would greet us, Eric Collings, who ran the place with his wife Mary, and I'd say, Eric, can I do it? Can I do it? And he knew what I meant, of course. It was, could I ride down, because it was 50 or 60 metres to the bottom, could I ride down in the Flying Fox? There were steps down, but there was this box on a pulley and a rope, and that they used for the luggage and the food and so on to get it down to the bottom. And sometimes Eric would let us kids go down in this. And I knew what I had to say. He'd say, why? And I'd say, uh, because it's dangerous. And he'd say, oh yeah, that's right, yeah, it's dangerous. So then I'd have to say to Dad, Dad, uh, Eric will let me ride down in the Flying Fox, and why do you want to do that? Because it's dangerous. And Dad would say, oh, well, if it's dangerous, then it's okay. <laughs> so that was the joke. And so I'd get to ride down on this thing, which in this box, bobbing, and the rope sort of sagging, and I'd going through the canopy of the trees and getting closer and closer to this wonderful beach. And when you got to the bottom, what you couldn't see from above was that there was a little camp there, a little series of chalets that Eric ran with Mary. Very shacky, very rudimentary. In fact, it was so shacky that it was like something that the sea might have washed up. And uh, the thing I liked best about this place, actually, was the dining hall. It was just, just a magical place. It was all whitewashed inside and... Um, it had rough-hewn tables, plank tables and benches and a big fireplace. But it was the walls. I still remember that on the walls there were glass balls that were emerald green that had been attached to lobster pots and broken free and washed up in the sea. And they were about this big. And they were beautiful, like globes. And there was even a, a ship's wheel above the fireplace. And uh, evenings, uh, the adults would be talking and telling stories and we kids would be half asleep there listening to the stories and watching the fire and looking up at these things on the wall and dreaming about where they came from, what ship or whatever. I'd be first up in the morning and I'd be dashing out this little gate that went, because there was sort of a wall around the place to keep the winds off, I'd be dashing out the gate and I'd come under this wonderful banksia tree that was just on the edge of the beach with great gnarled roots. And often sitting under that tree on a dinghy would be this round little man, brown as a berry. And my cousin has just reminded me that his name was Percy Usher. And in fact, he uh, was in his youth somebody who sailed around the Cape Horn in sailing ships. And the reason he had no chin was because he'd fallen off the mast and hit his head on the deck, apparently. I don't remember ever talking to him, but he was always there carving something. And I would dash down and throw myself in this beautiful turquoise sea and it would, oh gosh. And then probably run along the beach. And one end of the beach was this very special to me because when the tide came in, there'd be this much water on it and there'd be little mullets swimming around. And somebody told me how to catch these things. You got a oyster jar, which was about that long, and the, the opening was the same width as the jar. It was like a tube of glass. Put some bread in that, put it in the water, wait. The mullet would find the bread and they would swim in and silly fish, they could not turn around. And you'd have this this jar of glistening, you could pick it up and there'd be this jar of glistening silver 
wriggling things and I tip them into a, a bucket and get the bucket full and then I think usually I let them all go again. But that, that was great. And then the other drama of the rocks was that when they were dry and the sea, sea was out, they were full of cracks and really rough to the feet. But I had this talent or this idea that I could run over the rocks at full speed and not hurt myself. That somehow in midair my feet would decide where to come down, you know, in the safe way. And I did that. And um, years later, I found a diary talking about that and realized that I had developed as a sort of theory of life that if you ran at full speed through life with all the er the dangers below that somehow your feet or your mind would find the foot find the place and you'd you'd succeed and this was my my theory of how one should live so just to end up um, many many years later after the diary found me as a film producer in Moscow with my movie at a film festival and Katya was my translator lovely young Russian girl and uh, we had a nice time, uh, nothing romantic particularly, but she took me to Moscow Station on the last evening to see me off by train. I was going to Finland, a big gloomy station, sad moment. And I'd had this packet of photographs of Australia that I used to show people uh, where, you know, things that I liked. And she asked to see it one more time. She'd seen it. And she thumbed through the, the photographs and she finally came to one and she said, Michael, could I keep this one? I said, sure, why? And she said, oh, I just like it. It's sort of mysterious and there's nothing like that in Russia. And I looked at the photo she'd chosen. It was looking down on Bato Bay through the trees. So she took the photo. I thought I would never see her again. But things conspired, as they do, that some years later, Katia was my wife and a year after that we were moving to Australia and now that beach is somewhere that she loves as much as I do with our daughter Ellen. So I was going to show you a photo of Katia on that beach but I don't have it here so we'll have to do it. You just have to imagine her on the beach with blonde hair and sun and brown and completely removed from her Russian life.